Brian Flores is out of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and now he's moving on to be a defensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. What does this mean for the Steelers? We'll talk about that here today on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Also, joined by Wes Steeler, we're going to talk about some of the tougher contract questions the Steelers face this offseason with some of the players that are good, but are they worth the cap number that they that they represent? We'll go over that and more right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button on the video if you enjoy it. Hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. The only thing more exciting than the big game is the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. There's only... Five days left until the Super Bowl. Are you ready for it? You better be. The Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Learn more at NissanUSA.com. So let's get into this episode. First, full disclosure. I recorded a full episode before the Brian Flores snooze broke. And it's funny, we addressed it. We had Wes Euler on, and you'll see the rest of the episode after the first segment here. We even talked about Brian Flores probably go- being out. But then he actually left. I was hoping that hit for uh, that hit went Tuesday so that we could talk about it on Wednesday. But no, it hits Monday. So here we are in the Tuesday episode. So what you're going to see in today's episode or listen to, depending on what platform you're on, is my reaction here now on this first segment on Brian Flores. And then we'll get to those contract questions with the second and third segment because they were parsed up. So excuse me for any cutting and moving things around that we have in this episode. Full disclaimer there. All right. So, bottom line, Brian Flores is now out of being a senior defensive assistant for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He is now moving on to the Minnesota Vikings. This isn't that shocking. Um, you know, he was a successful coach, and I think the Steelers, as quickly as they grabbed him and as as much as he helped the Steelers this year, I think it was pretty obvious that people were back in on Brian Flores. Maybe not for a head coach, but definitely for a coordinator position, and now he gets to be a defensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, and and I, I think that's interesting because to me, the Vikings are, are, are a defense that need a lot of work. They finished at the bottom of the league in a lot of categories. Um, they have some young players. They got guys like Patrick Jones and stuff like that on their team that I think will uh, um, will work out for them eventually, but they have a lot of moves to make. And it'll be interesting to see how his fingerprints work over there. Um, I also think it's important to point out this will be – um, his first official stint as a defensive coordinator. We all talk about him as a defensive-minded coach because he was a defensive assistant for the Patriots and then a safeties coach and then a linebackers coach, and then he jumped from that to head coach. He was also a special teams coach for the Patriots for all those years, but he was never officially a defensive coordinator. He went from position coaches uh, around the, the Patriots organization and then jumped to head coach for the Dolphins, then became the senior defensive assistant for the Steelers. Now he's at defensive coordinator for the first official time in his career um, for anyone who's trying to play off the impact that this will have on the Steelers. I'm not going to be one of those people. I, I think that Brian, I think the Steelers can still definitely compete next year, but Brian Flores was definitely an asset um, as Jerry Dulac and Ray Fittipaldo reported in the Pittsburgh post Gazette. You know, here's a quote from Chris Wormley uh, Steelers defensive lineman about how much Brian Flores helped them quote. He brought a sense of more attention to detail when it comes to certain things. He allowed us to, I think, play the run a lot better, not just from a defensive line aspect, but from a team aspect. Knowing where guys are going to fit, I think he had a big part in that improvement. The Steelers went from dead last in the run last year for the first time since like the 1940s as an organization, and then jumped into the top 10. They were number nine overall in yards allowed against the run, eight in yards per attempt. And that's a heck of a jump. Now, granted, it's not all Brian Flores, right? You know, Miles Jack brought some stability to the linebacker room. We'll get to Miles Jack in a bit because his con his salary cap hit for this year is very interesting. Um, but uh, you know, and certainly Larry Ogan Joby stepping into the defensive line 
was it was a boost. So like, there were lots of things there. A healthier Devin Bush, even though he wasn't the star, he was a solid option for a, a, at the linebacker position. So there were certainly personnel pop, you know, things there. But there's no doubt that Brian Flores had an impact. And Kenny Pickett even said on Cam Hayward's podcast how you know he was you know he yeah, Brian Flores helped him a little bit. There's things like that that you're going to miss from having the eyes of another head coaching caliber type of type of person on, on your staff just kind of hanging around there. But we also knew the Steelers, they knew they weren't going to be able to keep him for too long. They wanted to give him an opportunity when no one else in the league was, you know, was, you know, might not have after his lawsuit. And um, I think the Steelers, it's a cool thing the Steelers did. And now he, you know, that this is a guy, Brian Flores, who's been with the organization and someone that you can say, you know, the Steelers had a, had a part in his career. Um, but I don't think there's any sour grapes to be had here. The Steelers weren't getting rid of Terrell Austin. That's not how they do. They don't just fire guys that they make promise to promises to um, just to just to bring in a guy who, you know, like Brian, Brian Flores here. I, I think Brian Flores also knows he wants to be a head coach sooner rather than later. I'm not sure, sure how long he'll be a defensive coordinator with the Vikings. Um, I think he might just be waiting for the right situation with the right NFL team to jump into that head coaching position. And now if he gets to be a defensive coordinator and if he flips the Vikings from a bottom of the NFL type of defense into a middle tier defense, or even a, one of the better, a top 10 defense next year, I, I think it'll make his head coaching case a lot stronger when he makes that push forward. So I, I don't really have some magical take about this. I think it's just, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate for the Steelers that they lose such a talented guy who I do think is, you know, has a great future ahead of him in the NFL. He's the only, uh, only head coach in the last 20 years to lead the Dolphins to back-to-back -back winning seasons. I, I, I don't think that he did that by mistake. I think that he, you know, put a lot of effort into fix that, that organization. And um, you saw some of that carry over to this year. Uh, where they were, where they had some stability, even when Tyree Kill and Tua Tungabailoa weren't able to, you know, make a whole ton of plays for them. So, um, but you know, the Steelers, they got they got some usage out of them. The, the players on the team, I think they learned from them. The biggest thing now is what do the Steelers do with the with the departure of Brian Flores? Do they fill that coaching spot because he was also the linebackers coach? Um, there's a thought that maybe they could go get someone. And that could be interesting to see. Do they go out and get a, a linebackers coach who could be a young defensive mind that could be working their way up because Tara lost and he's been the secondary secondary coach for a bit now, or not, not, it, it, but, but leading up to this year. Um, and that's kind of how he worked his way up into that position with the Steelers. Now they have a chance to get a, a, a young defensive mind at the linebacker group, work with a new group of guys too. And I think that's also going to be very interesting. How new will the linebacker group be, be this upcoming year? Devin Bush, we presume, won't be back because of his contract situation. He's run out of his rookie contract. He's going to be hitting free agency, and he hasn't sounded all that excited about signing back with the Steelers. Robert Spillane's a free agent, and whereas I think that he fits as a nice puzzle piece on the depth chart, they need other options. Um, so you have those two guys, and then Miles Jack is a, is, a, is the guy that's, that's sticking around in the roster, him and Mark Robinson, but – you look at Miles Jack's cap hit, it's $11.2 million. It's a lot of money for a guy who didn't produce a single turnover this year. And that's not to say that he couldn't, but I think it produces some interesting questions about how the Steelers need to handle their roster. That's my way to tease in what was going to be one of the main subjects that we talked about in this show today, because now I'm going to throw it to our show with uh, the rest of our show where Wes Euler was on with us. Um, earlier in the day when we recorded on uh, early Monday afternoon. So stick with us here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. Wes and I are going to break down. We got some interesting thoughts about Miles Jack and other players who I think aren't as easy contract answers for how the Steelers need to handle this offseason and how Omar Khan and Andy Weidel in that front office can make new fingerprints and establish new trends for how the Steelers handle certain situations. Will they stay the status quo or will they break off into their own path and create an Omar Khan type of way, the kind of we know, the kind of way that we knew Kevin Colbert had his own type of way? We'll talk about all of that here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. So don't go anywhere. We got a lot. We, we got to talk with Wes here. Um, but before we do any of that, we got to talk to you about our sponsors at Prize Picks. Prize Picks, of course, is daily fantasy made easy. If you if you're tired of playing the daily fantasy games where you're picking entire lineups and then competing with thousands of people to see if that your lineup hit the lottery, excuse me, this is your chance to play against that. Prize picks is easy. All you do is pick two to six players, and there's going to be prize picks projections. 
You just have to guess on those two to six players that you picked, do, do they get more or less than the prize picks projections? For example, if you're in the Super Bowl and you th- and, and prize picks says that Patrick Mahomes is going to throw two and a half touchdown passes, you just have to say more or less than the Super Bowl. And if you hit, you hit. And you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. And prize picks isn't just, the, isn't just football. So when the Super Bowl is over, you can still keep playing. There's NBA. NHL, there's MLB when that comes back around, and there's college sports. So go get some prize picks right now. You can download prize picks as an app on your mobile device, or you can go to prizepicks.com to sign up today and play daily fantasy sports. And first time users receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's L O C K E D O N locked on on the prize picks app or at prizepicks.com. And now, here's the start of my segments with Wes Euler from Steeler Nation Radio, who we had on the show. But of course, as I said, we've had to edit it because of the Brian Flores news, and I had to kind of redo the show a bit. So here's me and Wes talking in segment number two. We're joined, as I said before, by our friend Wes Euler. He has been on the show for a bit, but we welcome him back with open arms. Always happy to have you on the show. Wes, how you doing, my friend? What's up, CC? Always good to be here. Uh, always know I got to come correct on Locked On, right? Because we got a good football audience here. And uh, I am also looking forward to the big game uh, on Sunday. Absolutely, we all are. And we'll get to that later in the week. But Wes, I wanted to ask you about some of the tougher questions that the Steelers might have this offseason as far as what will be their roster construction or who, which players they'll keep because the Steelers made a point to get certain veterans to add to the roster this, this past season. And, um, and, and like, you know, the, the veteran guys that can hold down the Ford kind of keep up the level of play and not be like an ultra weakness at the position. But sure. now some of those guys are tied to contracts that are going to be a little tough to answer for. And we're going to go through a group of guys who I think aren't as easy. Like there's easy ones like William Jackson, the third, he's $12.1 million of a cap hit, but he didn't play a single game for them last year. He was hurt. There's no way he's playing at that rate. Uh, If he even plays for the Steelers next year, it's for a significant cutback on what he would be paid. Um, And there's other guys like, you know, presuming that they do bring back Cam Sutton because he's, I think a huge need for them in this, in this off season. Um, But there's, there's other guys that are getting paid decent amount of money and counting a decent amount of money against the cap who I do think the Steelers need to look at how they're being paid and either decide either, hey, do we need to restructure? Do we need to extend and kind of spread that money out? Sure. Or do we need to cut? So we'll go over some of those top candidates. And the first one on my list is a starting linebacker who I think had a good season, but maybe not the great season that's going to be worth the salary cap hit that they're currently projected to have in 2023. And that's miles Jack, you know, miles Jack. Again, I've, I thought he played well for the Steelers. I thought he brought stability to the linebacker group when that was desperately needed after what they've gone through over the past few years with mm-hmm. Ryan Shazier's injury, then, then Devin Bush's injury and then his recover recovery from the injury. And miles Jack brought that he led the team with 104 combined tackles, on the season, um, but not a single turnover. Didn't force a fumble, didn't get an interception. And normally the Steelers like to have their off ball linebackers be playmakers. Mm-hmm. And now this year, Wes, he's slated to make $11.25 million or count $11.25 million against the Steelers' salary cap. If they were to cut him outright, it would save them $8 million in cap space. And I think with that money, you could go get a, a good linebacker or a good player in another position. But I don't think the Steelers need to do that. I think they need to find a way to extend him to keep him around. He's in his late twenties. I believe he'll be 28 this upcoming season. Um, I think that they need to find a way to extend him, spread some of that money out, keep him on the roster while they go and find their net, the other, the linebacker who they're going to pair with and presuming they don't bring back Devin Bush. I think what you just laid out is the ideal scenario. Look, um, miles Jack is a nice player. I think we, I think we can all agree on that. But kind of as you alluded to, is there a play that you can pull out of the lexicon of your memory from this last season where you went, right. wow, Miles Jack really changed the game there? 
You know, right. you you can do that with T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith. You can certainly do that with Minka Fitzpatrick. You can do that with Cam Hayward. I mean, you, you you remember certain plays throughout the season where those guys just had an insane individual effort to force a turnover, to make a wow play, to block an extra point, whatever it might be. There weren't really any of those with Miles Jack. You don't think back to, oh, yeah, remember when he did this? Remember when, to when he did that? Um now, with saying all that, too, like you said, he is a solid player. But I think in a salary cap league, one of the one of the easiest ways, one of the quickest ways to get yourself in trouble is to pay a good player great money. Right. And he is approaching that, not quite there in terms of that upper crust linebacker money, but kind of in that next wave when you start to get the double digits. Um, and that is just... It's just too much to have uh, on your books for a player like Miles Jack. Again, Miles Jack is a player that you want on your team. I think that that's fair to say. I think we all agree on that, and you are correct in saying, particularly at that position. Ever since the the you know just the the tragic injury to Ryan Shazier, there's been it's been like a shuffling of chairs, a shuffling of cards every single year there yeah. at that position. He did offer some stability there, and that's good. That's important. But man, when you're starting to talk over ten million dollars uh, against the cap. That's when you need those guys to be, you know, not just solid players. You need them to be game changers. You need them to be playmakers. And I, I don't think Miles Jack is that. But you're right. I would like to have him around. When I just look at it from, you know, you kind of take the the contract specifics out of it, I think we would all like to have, have Miles Jack back and around. And to be able to do that without handcuffing you to, you know, if there's still somebody in the draft or free agency that you want to target that isn't going to break the bank, you've, you've got some money there to do so. I think you're right. That feels like um, the correct kind of middle ground for these two parties because Miles Jack, if you're to believe everything that he said too, like I think he wants to be here. Yeah. You know, he's he's come from an unstable organization now to a organization of the Pittsburgh Steelers that defines stability. He speaks so glowingly of Mike Tomlin and Terrell Austin. And yeah, a guy who by the time this podcast airs might not be a Steeler anymore. Brian Flores. Um, mm. I, I think, I think he's enjoyed his time in Pittsburgh. I think he likes playing for this defense and for this staff. And if you can kind of find a middle ground where, Hey, we're going to extend you, but it might, you know, knock just a little bit off the top of your, of your cap hit here. I think that's probably the, the best solution for both parties. No, I hear, I hear you on that part because that's, I think that's a big part of this. And again, this isn't trying to say that miles Jack, you know, deserves less. It's just a matter of managing rosters. And this comes with the tough questions that come with a tough business in the NFL. You know, you only have so much money that you can spend each year and you have to find ways to, you know, prioritize keeping, keeping the certain stars on your roster and keeping up in space so that you can get stars on your roster yep. um, and, and pay guys to keep them around. And Miles Jack being a, a veteran they brought in, I think that he's a veteran that they even, that they, that he likes and to be there and they like for him to be there. I just think that, like you said, eleven point two million dollars. That's a lot of. That's great money for a good player and a tough thing to ask. I want to. We'll be right back with more of from that conversation. As I said, I had to do some editing here on the Locked On Steelers podcast after the Brian Flores news came out and kind of reconfigure this episode. But don't worry, Wes and I will get back to those very points that we were making right there in that show. But before we do any of that, we got to talk to you guys about our great sponsor at Built Bar. Built Bar, of course, is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar because all, all different Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, but they're oh so healthy for you while being oh so tasty. They come in different, several different flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut, almond, and so many more. But when you get a Built Bar, you're only getting 130 calories and you're only getting four grams of sugar. But somehow they're packing 17 grams of protein. So if you need to make gains, Built Bar is for you. You don't need to wait around to get a box anymore. For years, we had we told you on the on the Lockdown Podcast Network, go to Built.com and order them and they'll be right at your door. But you can still do that, but there's easier ways now. You can go right to your local Walmart or Sam's Club and pick up boxes of Built Bars to have right in your right in your home. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, and you can walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up, pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with the hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. Trust me, when you try Built Bars, you'll thank me later because Built Bars are the ultimate protein bar that tastes like a candy bar.
We now resume the Locked On Steelers podcast and get back into another segment where Wes and I were talking about contract situations and some other names that came up in our talk that the Steelers might not have some some easy answers for this offseason. Here's the rest of that clip and the rest of the episode right here. I wanted to lead with the, the with the roster question, though, because I wanted to talk about this in splitted segments because Miles Jack, I think, is, is his own conversation. But another guy that I have to ask that question about is Jakumo Okorafor because he played well at offensive line. He, 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 again, but he's kind of – Chukumo Okorafor, Chukumo is going to be who he's going to be. He's not a dominant presence. He's not exactly – he's not a liability, but he's kind of a stable presence where you could put him at right tackle. I still don't understand. I think that he would be fine at left tackle. I think his traits would actually be more suited for what, this, what, what a left tackle does, especially for a quarterback like Kenny Pickett. But, hey – you know, they want to put him at right tackle. But right now, Wes, he is slated to make thir- to count $13 million, a little yeah. over that, $13 million and $83,000, million dollars against the salary cap. That is a huge chunk of money. That is the currently the Steelers' fifth most expensive cap player. They have TJ Watt, who's going to be at $29.3 million, Cam Hayward at 22.2, Mika Fitzpatrick at 18. All three of those, you can justify. They're playing yeah. at all pro all levels. pros, pro bowlers, yeah. Yeah. Deontay Johnson, 16.3 million. We'll talk about him in a second. But Chikuma Core 4 is the one where it's like, man, it's tough. It's tough to look at that contract and think like, ah, yeah, that's that that's totally justified. And he has two more years on his contract. If the Steelers were to cut him, they would only get about 6.9 million of that back this year. Uh, 6.1 million of that is guaranteed uh this upcoming season. Um but hmm. I, I don't think they're cutting him because he was like, again, he was a decent yeah. player. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I graded him with a C plus on the season with our final grades of stars and skulls. And he's, he's 20, he'll be 26 next year. So like, it's not like he's, he's still young, right? Yeah. He's still very young, he's but 20, man, he's only 25 and a half. E- exactly. But is that $13 million cap charge too much right now for what he's, pl- what, how he's playing right now, Wes, or do you bank that and just trust that he's going to get better? So, you know what's funny is if you would have asked me this same question at this time last year, I would have banked that and I would have said, I bet you he gets better. Um, this past year, I don't think Chooks' ceiling increased, but I do think it's fair to say, I think you got to give him some credit that I would say his floor increased, right? right? Like, I think Chooks was a solid B, B-plus player in pretty much every game. He didn't have, he didn't really have many games where you look at it and you say, wow, he was dominant, but he also didn't have any games where you look back and say, man, Chooks was an absolute liability out there this afternoon. He was a solid right tackle in the NFL. If we were to make a list to rank all the right tackles, you know, one through 35 or 40 or whatever number we wanted to pick, 32, I bet you he would be in the top 10 or the top 12. And, you know, that's, that's, that's about where you want him to be. That number is a little high. I think when you combine and when you consider the fact that Chooks and James Daniels both together on the right side of that offensive line are commanding close to a $25 million cap hit next season together, that's a big number. Now, it's also fair to say those two, I think, were, were your best offensive linemen last year. So that, to me, is the real question. You know, you, you mentioned Chooks' age, 25 and a half. Like, he won't be 26 until next season. It's not like he's turning 26 here soon. He's he's still got some time to go. He he won't be uh, he won't be 26 until in season next year. Right. Um, Mason Cole as well too. James Daniels. All those guys are right in that 25, 26 uh, age group where you would think they are right about to hit the prime of their careers. You know, for the mm-hmm. next three or four seasons, you've got those three all locked up for the next two years. Chooks, James Daniels, Mason Cole are all signed through the 2024 season. Same with Kendrick Green and with Dan Moore. Honestly, really, Kevin Dotson is your only one in that group uh, who's only got one year left on his deal. So you've got. Uh, most of that offensive line locked up to two-year contracts. You've got none of, of those five locked up beyond 2024. Now's the time where you really have to decide how long do we want to keep these guys around? Do we want to try and replace them with a high value, uh, 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 you know, a high pedigree draft pick, 17th overall, 32nd overall, whatever it may be? Or do we think that these guys are good enough at their age that maybe we can lock them down now to a price that two years from now will look team friendly, uh, you know, in retrospect? If I could get that number to come down a little bit for Chooks, I think that would be ideal. Like like in 2024, Chris, Chooks' cap hit is is about $11 million. That, I think, is 
you'll work with that number as opposed to 13. And I know that on paper, that's not a huge difference, but in your margins for building your roster, that, that does make a substantial difference. If you can keep Chooks around 11, James Daniels around 11, you know, Mason Cole is making in that six range, um, then all of a sudden, I think you like what you have there in terms of the kind of the bones of that offensive line, right? Like the, the foundation of that offensive line, and you're not paying an arm and a leg for it, but it also wouldn't procure you from if there's somebody there at 17 that you really like, if there's somebody there at 32 that you really like, going out and getting those guys. You now, obviously, now is the time to start thinking, and I know the Steelers don't operate like this, but hey, then again, it is new. It is new minds in charge, in, in terms of Omar Khan and Andy Weidel and these guys. Like I, I really hope that the Steelers are looking at the next four years as a window to load up. And I know they don't operate this way. They look at every year as this is an opportunity for a championship. No single year is more important than any year else. We, right. we try and put the best product on the field every season and make decisions that will continue to allow us to do so. But I'm sorry, when you have a first-round quarterback, a quarterback that you drafted in the first round that we saw last year can win you games, that's when you load up around that guy. Look around the National Football League. I'm not breaking any news here. You see how loaded the Eagles roster is? Yeah, it's because Jalen Hurts is still on his rookie deal. Do you see how loaded the San Francisco 49ers roster is? Yeah, because they're not paying a quarterback crazy money. Do you see how loaded Bengals. you see how loaded the Bengals offense is? It's because Joe Burrow's still on his rookie contract. There's a reason why Patrick Mahomes is the only quarterback still standing on championship weekend that wasn't still on his rookie deal. That is the cheat code in the National Football League is to find a rookie quarterback that you can win games with and for four or five there four or five years there, load up around them before you have to pay them. That's what I hope the Steelers are looking to do on offense. And so if you can save a little bit on Chooks, maybe you save a little bit on Deontay Johnson, you know, combine that with Miles Jack and some of these other discussions that we've had, I think that's the formula for the Steelers. You, you go out and you see what you can do in free agency, and then you obviously attack with your three top 50 draft picks, and you try and build this offense in, with the mindset of we are, we're going to win a Super Bowl in the next three or four years. And, and you know that you don't have to pay your quarterback until then, and, and you can really surround him with some talent. That, to me, is the way to operate and how I hope they're seeing this. I, I know that that's not very Steelers way-esque, but I think in the National Football League now, if you're not thinking that way when you have a first-round rookie quarterback that you know can win you games, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. So if, if sitting down with Chooks and saying, hey, we'll add another year or two to your deal, but we want you to come down closer to 10-11 as opposed to 13 – I think that that would be smart business, and it would give it would take a position off the board where all right, we don't have to worry about right tackle. You know, we'll cross this bridge in three, four years when we have to pay Kenny Pickett, and then we'll evaluate everything else around him. But we know that we don't have to worry about it until then. Did you hear Wes Euler, y'all? You want to run through a wall after that, man? You say this this is the window right this here. You, you need to be gearing up this offense for four years with the mindset of we're going to win a Super Bowl in the next four years. And you know what? And I know again, I know this isn't the Steelers' way, right? But if you do that and you win a Super Bowl in the next four years, or let's say you get to one and it doesn't end up going your way, and in 2026 or 2027 you have a 6-11 and 11 season, who cares, right? Like, it, Chris, you think, you think if the Eagles, two years from now, the Eagles have to pay Jalen Hurts and they take a step back and they go 6-11, and 11, but if they win the Super Bowl this year, you they think their that. fan base cares? They're, they're right. in the Super Bowl right now. Like, right. and again, I know that that's not how the Steelers operate. But the cheat code to building rosters in the NFL is to have a rookie quarterback that you can win games with, and you've got the rookie quarterback that you can win games with, and you won't have to pay him for the next three or four years. Go and surround that guy with the talent to do what Jalen Hurts has done, and to do what Joe Burrow has done, and to build the roster that the 49ers were able to build because they're not paying a quarterback. That, to me, Steeler Nation, is the move. I hear you on that, Wes. I, I, I actually, I think that there's there's definitely a lot of merit to that part of the conversation too and something to keep exploring this year. How aggressive will Omar Khan, because again, this is Omar Khan's front office now. It's a new regime, yep. So how they were pretty aggressive in their trade for to get Chase Claypool out of town and get a second round pick for that, a really good second round pick that is now the mm -hmm. 32nd pick overall. Will they and make I, aggressive moves to set themselves up like that? Yeah. That's going to be and one one other thing to add to that too. Sure. And I think I think you know around the draft last year I told you this. The thing that I loved most about the Steelers drafting Kenny Pickett is that they didn't give themselves any wiggle room for a rebuild. Like they they said, right. "Here's our here's our guy, first round pick, first quarterback off the board that we've seen for 5 years 
we're 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 going again. Like we don't care that we just lost our 18 year Hall of Fame quarterback. A lot of organizations could use that as an excuse to. We just lost it. We just lost a first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback, two time Super Bowl champion. We, we've got some leeway with our fan base here. You know, if we're, if we're just if if we're not so good for the next two years, they'll understand we just lost Ben Roethlisberger. The Steelers didn't do that. The Steelers doubled down. They drafted Kenny Pickett in the first round and said we go again. And I love that. Like I, I love that they didn't want that excuse. In fact, they went the opposite way. They almost continued that onus to keep winning. Um, and now let's see if they can, you know, really take that to the next level, which to me would be to operate in terms of a, a four-year window here or so. There you go. Operating in a four-year window, seeing what they can do, loading up to find ways to win with Kenny Pickett over the next couple of years. I've been saying all offseason, and I'll continue to say all offseason, I think they're a lot closer than people think they are at being one of those teams that can compete for a conference championship and maybe even a Super Bowl in the coming years. Wes, thanks so much for joining us here in the Locked On Steelers podcast. Let people they can find you, follow you, get more of your work. Yep, at Wesley Euler on Twitter. I, of course, uh, host the Steelers Blitz with Arthur Motes on SNR at noon. Easiest way, though, I mean, if you want to just subscribe wherever you get your podcast, Steelers Blitz, you can find us there as well, too. And then for all of my fellow tortured Mountaineer souls, as always, Ears and Beers and In the Gun, those are the, uh, the WVU shows and podcasts that I do as well. Appreciate you, Wes, and appreciate all our listeners and viewers, whether you listen to us on any podcast platform or check this out on YouTube. Like this video if you saw it and enjoyed it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you want to help out the show even further, go on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star review with a positive comment. You do both at the same time. You get a special shout-out at the end of the show. Like this person, QM Simeon, who says, five stars, great show, best perspective on the Steelers from a global, global to microscopic level. Thank you for your always fair reporting of our team and having great conversations with highly knowledgeable guests. We thank you, QMC. I mean, we got another five-star review we'll read on tomorrow's episode with the Lockdown Steelers podcast. Thanks again to Wes for joining us. We'll see you then right here on the Lockdown Steelers podcast.